Yo, good morning. Or for those listening on the audio only format, good morning. I'm assuming you all will be listening <laughs> on a Monday morning, getting ready for uh, the fantasy week. But this is the Total Basis Podcast. I am your host, Felipe Melicio. Over there is Sean Connor Flannery. Sean, how you doing this morning? Little tired, you know, living that nightlife or a uh, night shift life. Um, but uh, ready to uh, get another uh, episode in. Excited. Yeah. Uh, baby woke up multiple times last night. And we're, like, this is like about two or three weeks in a row where she's not sleeping through the night. And it's driving me crazy. And uh, but uh, Crazier than it, White Sox baseball? What's that? I said crazier than White Sox baseball. Oh, nothing's crazier than White Sox baseball, man, or, or Cubs baseball in this matter. But uh, no, it, it's uh, she's... Uh, I don't know. Uh, well, we, we're hoping the, that we might have uh, figured out what, what's wrong with her. So I'll, uh, I'll report back next week and see <laughs> if, if, the, if our adjustments work. I mean, that's basically it. I mean, my baby's basically the way is I treat my baby the way I treat my fantasy baseball teams. I just constantly make adjustments, uh, tinker here and there, <laughs> and then I end up losing in the semifinal of the Baseball Life uh, Fantasy Baseball League, which that's going to be our focus for today. See as, if you uh, can pick up a new pacifier on the waiver wire. You know, I mean, totally uh, understandable, you know. Or a new rattle. Maybe yeah. that old <laughs> rattle doesn't work. She wants a new rattle. I mean, we're already talking about how I'm going to buy the entire uh, baby section of uh, uh, toy section of Target once uh, Christmas rolls around. So I'm going to be that dad, man. I'm just I'm, I'm going to go to Target and I'm just going to buy everything on the left side of the aisle. That's going to be for the baby. So Hey, and um, if you buy too much, then they might eject you out of the store. Um, are, are you going to kick some dirt on the uh, the cashier as you manager? I'm going to go full Karen. I'm going to go full Chad. Gonna, how dare you, sir? <laughs> sir, may I speak to your corporate officer? That's you basically know? what Josh Donaldson did uh, this past oh. week, which was <laughs> yeah. really yes. interesting. Go kick some yes. dirt on the cashier while you're uh, trying to buy the new Rattlers. <laughs> Isn't there like a an arena football team called the Rattlers too? I believe so. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I'm uh, getting distracted here. But yeah, this is the Total Basis Podcast uh, talking to you about both fantasy and real baseball. We're, the, the goal is always that the information we spill out for you, it does not only apply for fantasy, but it also applies to any uh, any uh, curi- curiosities you people might have about real baseball. Like, why did Josh Donaldson hit dirt? Does that improve his fantasy stock for next year? I don't know, <laughs> but... And it's, you know, like we even had a a post in Baseball Life this past week of, you know, somebody asking what is war. And it's, you know, it's starting to become more mainstream. It is so mainstream that Chipper Jones actually posted on his Twitter yesterday uh, the top three candidates for NL MVP. And it was, he put Freeman, Betts, and Tatis Jr. And the first three stats that he used for each were F4, WOBA, WRC+. Wow, and, and there's a lot of fans out there, especially, you know, people that probably are big time Braves, chipper fans, you know, that are probably like, what are these numbers? With and, that same accent too, by the way. Yeah, yeah, and that's what we're here for. We want to explain you or explain to you guys in a way that we all understand, you know, that there is more than one way to skin a gap, skin a fantasy cat. You know, this guy might not be a great batting average threat, but does he do a lot of other things? Especially yeah. in, a, in a our league where we have eleven categories, because you know we're crazy. And uh, and <laughs> and you know what? And and we're not experts. I don't consider myself an expert. I'm just I love baseball, and you know I, I I didn't grow up with these numbers, with these statistics that are now the new thing. Like you said, Chipper Jones is now citing them, which that's crazy in my in my book. I, I never imagined a, a, a living in a life. Where Chipper Jones is, is quoting WRC plus. Yeah, I, I was thoroughly shocked, but excited. I thought that was awesome. That's a great platform. Yeah, and uh, but the reason we know about this is because we went out and researched it on, on our own. I mean, yeah. like I said, I wasn't on, I wasn't like Fangraphs uh, fan number one uh, from the get go. I had to learn all this stuff on the fly, and same thing with Sean. And, and it's all because we're just curious about the game, and this is what. Uh, a lot of teams are utilizing nowadays. They don't care about batting average anymore unless, you know, there's a certain hitting profile for certain players that allows for them to care about batting average. But if you're not that type of player, then we got to look at some other, other qualities that you might have. So um, it's, it, it seems to be the general outlook for a lot of these major league baseball teams. And that's how it converts. And then it just goes down to us who are – not only curious about the game, but we're also trying to compete in this other game called fantasy baseball. And we try to get,
get an edge as best as we can over our opponents. Uh, just even though it's it's not real baseball, it's real to us, damn it. And we're we're, we're competitive. <laughs> I, we're always- I sent real money to your to your PayPal, <laughs> and, and now you're not getting it back, unfortunately. Oh wait, is there a third place? I don't think we agreed to the third place, right? Yeah, I think it was just the top two. I think I'm not 100 percent sure. All right, I'll I'll double check. I have a spreadsheet somewhere, but uh, yeah, it seems like. Well, let's get to it, man. Uh, the fantasy playoffs yeah. are here for a championship week. Uh, we already have our top four uh, picks for next year, as that that's been already settled. But do you have those at the top of your head, or do I have to look them up? Uh, I think we'd have to look them up, but it I'm was it. it's, it's going it. to be in no particular order: Whelan, Henry, and I forgot the last two because I'm terrible. Yeah, because it's uh, we uh, set up a bunch of playoffs for ourselves, and like I said, we want to make sure that these guys earn it, that they're still playing throughout the season, that, that there's no shortcuts, you, no tanking allowed. You, you got to earn your spot for next year. And okay, I have it. I have the the top four picks for next year. Right, give it to the it's going to be Matthew Whelan with the number one overall pick, uh, King Pooty Henry with number two, Mike Harvey number three. And our very own Jacob Moses, who is listening. Uh, thanks for listening in, bud. Um, he's going to have the fourth overall pick. Congrats, Jacob. <laughs> That's like the most Mets thing that can happen to poor Jacob. Is you like, get the fourth overall pick. <laughs> the fourth overall pick on, on a year where, where, where his team was pretty lousy, unfortunately. And uh, uh, also, uh, I see Austin is listening in. Good morning, Austin. And uh, I, I guess I got to bring up the, uh, the newbie league because he's been in the newbie league. And right now, I'm in the playoffs against uh, John Keating, who's running for a political office down in Springfield, Illinois. I hope he doesn't mind that I'm giving him a shout-out in that manner, but quick shout-out to John over in Springfield. And John and I were tied at, at five categories each, so it's still anybody's game as these newbies are testing my fantasy acumen here. I believe Austin is also a really good team. Let me see, what did he, yeah, he uh, finished in second place behind me in my division, so I'm – just going to double check and see where his team fell. Uh, oh, he's, he's beating the number one seed in his, uh, in his group, uh, uh, six categories of three. So Austin is also – looks like he's going to be ex, uh, going on to the next round of the Newbie League here. Uh, Sean, how'd you do in the Newbie League? Were you uh, even paying I attention fin- to I, I finished uh, with the 10th seed. Uh, that was the one I went full pitching, and, like, it, it, it just really <laughs> didn't work out. It, it really didn't. Uh, Max Scherzer, Clayton Kershaw. I mean, Kershaw has done well. Clevenger was kind of up and down. I had Paddock. A lot of injuries. It, it didn't work out as well as I thought it was going to work out. And, and I've never been great in standard 5 by 5 leagues. It, it's something that I want to improve at. Yeah. I always seem to I, – I care so much more about, you know, like the total skill set of a player that it leads me to – not pick guys that are actually great in five by five leagues because they have a high batting average and steal bases. I, I tend to gloss over that, um, especially because I'm in more of points leagues or like ours where we have eleven categories. Yeah, not just categories, but we're in, we're in a keeper league, so we also yeah. got to account for future value as well, uh, which is ironically an intangible that we have to keep in mind of at all times. Uh, but yeah, I, I agree with you on the on the five by five. That's no, not normally my forte, but I figure with the newbie league, I I make it as easy as possible, but make it fun. So I added the head to head aspect to it. But you're right, and this is something that Mario Margola uh, and I would argue about uh, or discuss uh, in previous podcasts uh, back and forth. Is uh, you know that, that 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 is one of my problems, like you mentioned, is that I don't I don't draft for categories or statistics. I draft for uh, player, and that's something I mentioned on Thursday night over at the Football Life Presents The Audible with Matt and Randy. Uh, when Matt Borson asked me, How do you draft differently as a, uh, in football as opposed to baseball? And in baseball, I, I flat out told him, I go out of my way to draft the best player available. Like, I, I don't care about stolen bases or home runs, or I don't, I don't draft by stats. Like, I draft like by my, my whatever I think is the best player at that position. That's who I'm going to draft to fill out my roster. Yeah. And uh, it's worked for me. Uh, especially in this league, in our league, I, I, I since the, uh, it's the inaugural season back in what 2016, you would say 2017. Yes, yeah, um, sev- 17. I want to say 17. Let's say 17. All right. Uh, and you know, Sean, my seasons we, we go short. We go we do sprints. We don't do the whole marathon. There's 26 weeks usually in fantasy baseball. I go 18 or maybe 17 or 18 regular season games, and we finish by early September because you know yeah. football season's around the corner, right? I do you guys a favor, and I do myself a favor. Make sure you <laughs> and everybody. 
But I've been fortunate enough to be, as far as I'm concerned, the only team in this league to win double-digit uh, wins since the very beginning. Every year I win 10 or more games. And I think even this year I won 10 games, and even though we didn't have enough games to play. But, uh, you, oh, no, no, no. It was only, I, I finished 8-3. and three, So, but, you know, short in season. Regardless, like that's, it's worked. What hasn't worked, and this is what we're going to talk about, this is championship week, is at the, the final leg of, of, of the race here, and that's the, the playoffs. Playoffs? Yes, playoffs. Playoffs. And I, I don't have success there, I'll admit, in this league. I mean, we have a bunch of killers in this league, so I'm not surprised that it hasn't come as easy. But uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, ask for anything more or any uh, – I wouldn't expect anything less from my uh, league mates. So I'm – but let's get going. Right now, Aaron, who's the defending champion out of Canada – Back right in the kick. championship. Chicks take the long ball right here. And it looks like she's in a very prime position to defeat Jets team over here, who's a big Milwaukee Brewers fan. Going uh, into the last day of the season. Got yeah. a six-category lead. Let's see. If, and I, I really – it's almost a, a shame if uh, – Jet wasn't the one who had beaten me. But look at his offensive output this week, batting over 300 on base, close to 370, and he's still losing most of the offensive categories. Granted, RBI, stolen bases are all pretty close right now. But, um, yeah, he's definitely going to need some help today if he is going to bring home the title. Well, I mean, it seems like his luck is running out. I mean, I, I – I, I don't know. As you can see, I'm still flustered about my, about me losing to Erin, and that means I gotta like send her another banner up in Canada, and that was such a pain in the ass. Next <laughs> up to Canada, I was I always hope that she never wins, but I mean she's earned it, bro. I mean she's completely earned it in back to back years. If she goes and on and wins uh, uh, the league again, so I it's still um, we still have one more day of play, but it, I mean she's in prime position to defeat and repeat as champion, something that her Toronto Raptors couldn't do this year. But uh, she's going to carry that torch for them. I mean, look at her team. She has Jose Abreu, who's kind of uh, had a breakout. Not a breakout, but a, like a bounce back year of sorts. Because he looked like he was done. Yeah, I mean, uh, he's always like, even like last year, which was, it did feel like a down year. It's like, he's yeah. one of those guys who like in his sleep could hit 270 mm -hmm. and in a full season would hit 25, 30 home runs and drive in 100 runs. Just yeah. because of, you know, he does – hit the ball or get the ball in play. He doesn't walk a whole lot, um, which in this, in, in our league, you know, on base percentage matters. Your walk to strikeout ratio matters. But the thing with him is the RBIs are always going to be towards the top of the league. I always viewed him as like the poor man's Nolan Arenado. Especially in this league, uh, in, in this year with, with that stacked lineup that he, that he finally had, that has to be the best lineup he's ever been a part of since he's yeah. been with the White Sox. So, for sure, uh, for sure. And, and But you mentioned that he doesn't walk a lot. I mean, I think you, you put a graphic. I don't know if it was a meme or if it's actually real, but it's Jose Abreu, so I believe it, where oh. was it? Tre Trevor Bauer it, like throws a pitch. like Yeah, Trevor feet. Bauer threw a ball that bounced in the opposed the left-handed side batter's box. And Jose Abreu, Chuck swung. They appealed. They He swung. He was out. That was the swinging strike three. It bounced in the middle of the left-handed batter's box. It was wild. It was awesome. But it was, like, really unbelievable. And Well, no, I believe it because it is Jose Abreu. I mean, he's very aggressive. He's a swinger. Hitter. Yeah. He's a swinger, man. <laughs> he doesn't want to wait for his pitch. His pitch is whatever the, the, the pitcher throws, and he's going to swing at it. I mean, that's been his M.O., and that's what works for him. So we're not, I'm not going to accuse him of not being a professional hitter because making contact out of nothing is professional being a professional hitter. So – on the opposite side of the spectrum, Joey Votto, who I don't know why he shows up here. Maybe he got cut or got benched because we do a semi uh, – I'm sorry, what, what is it called, a semi-weekly league? It was a semi-weekly, but for the playoffs, we did entire week periods. But she probably substituted him in. Either he started the week and then she put a Bray in or vice versa. Okay, yeah. That's why, that's why there's the extra slot there because we were allowing a lineup change on that same Friday, Saturday, Sunday like we did in the regular season. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so basically you had two chances to fix your lineup. Monday, Monday morning before the first game of the uh, – of the uh, week. first game of that, yeah. uh, of that Monday. And then 
switch your lineup again on Friday if you if you must. You know, so it's a, it's a nice little feature. It's something that in all my years playing fantasy, a lot of fantasy owners can, where we are in weekly leagues wish that they could have that ability to just substitute someone in. Well, here it is in all its glory. And I think it's, I don't know about you, Sean, maybe you want to chime in on this, but I think it's a nice little wrinkle to uh, fantasy baseball. What do you think? Yeah, especially this year, you know, where we wanted to keep that head-to-head type season and doing the uh, semi-weekly, you know, two, two matchups a week. Um, so obviously you would set your lineup each time. Uh, you had the first four days, Monday through Thursday, and then Friday through uh, Sunday. Yep. Um, and I think the real wrinkle this year was how many double headers we had and how we managed using players who were in double headers. Because obviously, if they play both games, they're going to get 14 innings. But if they only play one game, then you run the risk that they're actually going to get less plate appearances or less innings pitched because of the seven inning d- double header rules. Yeah. So it, it was kind of a weird thing to navigate around. Yeah, and I didn't realize how frustrating that would be until you're, 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 you know, you're, you're experiencing it and suddenly your batter, who you think is going to get like all the plate appearances you can handle in one day, is still limited even with the double header because there's only seven innings. Yeah. Or the relief pitcher, right? Yeah. Uh, oh, man, there's a good chance that he might play twice. Well, because it's only a seven-inning game. The guy you're used to seeing in the seventh or eighth inning, like on your team, the relief pitcher, is not pitching double duty that game. And yeah, because the team. starter goes all seven innings. <laughs> or, they or something crazy. Some other craziness where they put in a bullpen guy to start like a couple of innings, and then they bring in the bullpen guys that weren't used earlier in the week or in the day. And it's it's uh, not what I expected, Sean. And uh, so instead of getting accumulation, we just get more frustration. And that's that's 2020 in a nutshell. Uh, even outside of fantasy baseball or baseball. Uh, but, yeah, look look at here, second base. I mean, they're stacked at second base, both of these guys, Ozzy Albies, B.J. Lenehu. It's a heck of a matchup. B.J. Lenehu coming back for Jet just in the nick of time to save his uh, team from floundering too much. And uh, that's been a big difference for him. Uh, Especially with Tatis kind of struggling uh, yeah. in the in September, D.J. LeMahieu coming back has been a saving grace for him. Yeah, so uh, we, we – Sean called it Tatis uh, will struggle this year, and it only took until the end of September to. I mean, uh, he still is in the 100th percentile of exit velocity, which is just insane. But I all that approach is so predicated on barreling up the ball and getting, you know, when he's hitting the ball as hard as he is now, if he gets it in the air, it's basically gone with the balls we have now. Um, But that inability to consistently make contact makes him very prone to these lulls and the same thing goes for Luis Robert who yeah. basically in the same time period since the beginning of September has started to really scuffle I, I want to say I saw that he's gone like four for 41 or four for 37 he's um, been awful he's been real awful yeah. the only reason I keep him in my starting lineup is because uh, compared to everybody else on my bench he's still a stolen base but yeah and he has in the last week or so, he's gotten me two net stolen bases, which is more than anybody else on my team at this point. Because, like I said, I don't draft for stolen bases, and that came back to bite me in the ass uh, in, the, in the latter stages of the, of the year here. But um, what was I saying? But, you know, Fernando Tatis Jr., the more you describe him, the more he sounds like a Javi, uh, Javier Baez or a Tim Anderson clone, which, you know, those guys seem to find success, although not Baez. He's been struggling. But I always thought Tim Anderson would never amount to anything because of that approach. And he's gonna be he's on the uh, in the talk to in talks to uh, win back to back batting titles, which I thought would never happen. So, um, you know, baseball in the, in, in the new decade is a is a strange one for sure. You also uh, well, you know, I don't want to go round by round here too much. Just want to highlight some of the uh, the uh, the more prominent players. And here's Jason Hayward. We were just talking about him off the air uh, with you, uh, Sean. How he's had a bounce back year and Jed took advantage of it. And that might be a reason why he was able to catch fire uh, in September during these playoffs. Would you agree with that? Yeah. And I want to say, like, we've talked about it on, on several episodes before and during the draft recap that I, I hated Jet's draft and he has made me eat every word of that. And I mean, Marcelo Zuna in this format finished as the 11th best hitter in the league and he had him, he drafted him in the 11th round. Um, so, well late. Um, he actually finishes, as of right now, 
he's tied with Mike Trout. So tremendous value there. Um, and then obviously Fernando Tatis in our format has been the best hitter. Um, good combination of the average. He's batting 280, uh, almost a 370 on base. Two nine. We actually have ISO, which is a cool thing with Fantrax. We were actually able to use ISO as a stat, which I don't. I never thought I, I would see. Uh, yeah. Tatis has an ISO close to 300. And so add that with seven net stolen bases. He's been by far the best hitter in the league. Um, Trey Turner actually finishes number two in this format. Um, but he, with uh, Marcelo Zuna and Fernando Tatis, that really powered the offense. Um, DJ LeMahieu finished as the 14th best hitter in our league. So he is three in the top 15 to go with his um, very not flashy, but very good pitching from this season. Really quick, uh, uh, you mentioned Tatis but has been number one in our format. I think at one point, Tatis was in all three of my, my leagues that I was in. He was the number one player in a points league, which is head to head, but still a points league. No, actually, this year we're not doing head to head, sorry, but still points league, number one, uh, the number one hitter, Fernando Tatis. In our newbie league, which is a five by five head to head league, but nonetheless a five by five league, the number one player was also Fernando Tatis. And in our league, Fernando Tatis is the number one hitter as well. So regardless of format, Tatis has been the best player this year. And that's with going into a two-and-a-half-week slump in September. Yeah. That's just how good he was the first month plus. Yeah. So, uh, no, he's been fire, man. Uh, I, I always – I'm just like you, man. I had my doubts on him because of all the of the hitting approach. But when you're that athletically gifted and you have that bat speed, which I that's the only explanation I can come up with is, his bat speed must be so ridiculous that he, it doesn't matter what his approach is. He's just going to hit everything and hit everything out of the park. And uh, that, it's the only explanation I can come up with. And it's worked for him. And it's also worked for, like, again, worked for Javi Bias for a long time until this year. And it worked, and it's working for Tim Anderson finally this year, so, yep. or the last two years. That's, so maybe there's something to it, uh, to having that approach. Uh, switching back to Aaron Steen, Mookie Betts. I mean, it, it, there's no – I mean, you, on one hand, you got Jet with Fernando Tatis, right? Yeah. On the other hand, Aaron has Mookie Betts. Yeah, who's been the third best hitter in uh, in this format for us. Like, and I, I have him in a points league, and he has just been, like, utterly dominant. Um, in that points league I'm in on fan tracks, I'm the number one offensive team, and I'm going up against the number one pitching uh, points team. And Mookie Betts has absolutely carried me. Um, I have no business being in this close matchup. I, I'm – forgot to do my waiver wire fab ads on Sunday. Oh, no. And so this guy had like eight or nine starting pitchers starting. And I, I think I'm, I had maybe five or six starts. Um, so, and he has like four more scheduled for today, but I have a, a very slim lead, but if he starts all those starting pitchers, I'm probably done for. <laughs> uh, what else we got here? I think Clint Frazier, Nick Castellanos, I mean, blah, 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 blah. You talked about the pitchers and, we, we realized that Jet is just went full Homer Simpson on, a, on his pitching set with Colbert. And it Simpson. worked. <laughs> and it worked. It worked. You know, something that I give shit to uh, my buddy Matt Bushnell about every single time we play fantasy, uh, anything, whether it, whether it be basketball, baseball, or, or, or football. It actually worked for somebody in, in the form of Jet, uh, who's a big Brewers fan, Corbin Burns, former Brewers, Zach Davies. Uh, yeah, he actually ended up having five – of the top 16 pitchers in our league in this format, uh, Davies, Burns, uh, Aaron Nola, Ken Samaeda, and obviously, uh, actually not obviously, Lance Lind finished as the second best as he has had basically nothing but good starts aside from one hiccup against Houston where he gave up six runs. Um, the shortest outing he's had was five innings. Every other outing has been at least six or more. Hmm. He's, I mean, he just picked up where he did last year. And in a, you know, a categories league, you know, really in a points league too, it's super valuable when these pitchers can go and eat up innings. He's thrown more innings than Shane Bieber, Lance Lynn has. He leads the league in innings pitched. So once again, just one of those not flashy but really worked out well for him. Kenta Maeda, I really did like coming into this year. Aaron Nola, I was fading, but has had a bit of a bounce back year. 
And then, of course, Corbin Burns has really caught fire the last month. And Zach Davies um, switching ballparks, going into a much more pitcher-friendly ballpark, and has really started striking more guys out than we ever thought he would. Um, So it's been an interesting development, but his pitching really, I think, was the strike. Even though he had the best hitter in the league, he had probably the best stable of pitchers in our league as well. Yeah, um, it just it drives me crazy. And, I mean, Jeremy Jeffers, I think he also used to be a Brewers, right? A Brewers player? Yes, a for, uh, former Brewer. And I, I just would like – I would be remiss if I didn't announce it that when the draft ended, I was very, very much worried about my pitching, as Felipe likes to remind me. Um, <laughs> my best pitcher was Herman Marquez – who ranked in as the 23rd best pitcher in this league. So I did not have one top 20 pitcher. Um, if somebody were to ask me what was my downfall in fantasy this year, it was not getting enough pitching. Yeah, and I feel the same way too. But I'm trying to actually, uh, on a separate screen, I'm trying to uh, look up to see where my top 20 pitcher ended up or if I had any top 20. Because we found out I didn't have any top top uh, 20 hitters, let alone a top yeah, I didn't have a top 10, top 15. Not, I think my best hitter was Dominic Smith. Was yeah, Dominic Smith out. was your best hitter, and he was at um, 34, <laughs> sandwiched in between Aaron's Heimer Condelario and uh, Whelan's Eloy Jimenez. And it's crazy. It's, it's just crazy to think that, 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 my, that my team, which was dominating the whole season, is just made out of patchwork band-aids and, and a hope and a prayer. <laughs> Dominic Smith ended up saving my season because a lot of my players that I uh, that were highly regarded did not show up uh, or did not play enough games to be ranked that high in this league. So um, it's just crazy. And then you, over here, you got Jed who went full Homer Simpson on me and is in the finals. So it's so it's such a strange year. But I like what Aaron did to kind of uh, circum or to kind of combat Jet's um, lightning in a bottle approach on drafting these Brewers players, these Brewers pitchers. Is that Aaron also went out of her way to pick up Devin Williams, who we talked about uh, with the super changeup that he owns. Not just Devin Williams, but he also she also has Josh Hader to kind of combat the fact that uh, she has to face uh, Brewers fan Jet and his pitching staff, and that yeah. kind of counterbalances everything. And it's just it's so weird. It's just so weird. There's so many wrinkles and and, and little uh, uh, storylines that are being played out in this final game of the season in our fantasy league. Yes, and it looks like. Um, as we finish kind of wrapping up on their matchup, uh, we faced each other, Felipe, uh, yeah. battle of the partners for a uh, third place, which we are still unsure if either of us get a prize, um, other than <laughs> bragging rights, you know, podcast you definitely get a prize though. You get the ninth pick overall for next year. If you win this game. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited. You should be. <laughs> um, but it's the the battle of the podcast partners. And once again, my team decided they wanted to hit again. And I had a great start off to the week. I want to say like by Wednesday or Thursday, I was like 30 plus RBIs and like 12 home runs. Uh, Luke Voigt obviously had like three or four. Um, Pitching has been okay, but uh, the hitting, I had three top 12 hitters. And it doesn't show it this week because I'm at negative two net stolen bases. But that was part of the reason I had such good hitters was my top three hitters were all guys that hit for average, hit for power, got on base, and stole bases. And uh, Trevor Story, Jose Ramirez, and Kyle Tucker. And all three are having pretty solid weeks for me. Yeah, and I see Luke Voigt, who has uh, Yankee fans want to uh, give him a, a monument out in a monument field because uh, he's had a, such a tremendous season. Well, I try to combat you with uh, Brandon Belt and Josh Bell. Has not worked so far this week for me. Uh, I would think that having Glavar Torres back, which he did have a decent week on his return from injury last week, uh, apparently Adam Frazier is holding his own against Glavar Torres. Yeah, I, I meant to pull Adam Frazier out of my lineup, and that was an oopsie on my part. Why would part. you want to, man? He's the clutchiest, clutchiest <laughs> player on the planet right now uh, since 2017. So uh, as we find out, clutch clutch is a very important thing. Well, you happen to have the most clutch player since 2017 on your team. Why would you drop him or bench him, uh, Sean? What is wrong with you? 
for for those of you who will be watching audio only, I just did the the meh. I uh, put my hands up. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I just forgot to get him out of the lineup. <laughs> why don't you believe in the? Why don't you believe in clutch though, Sean? Because he, I was just streaming him because I needed a, a second baseman because I lost Cattell Marte and Howie Kendrick all at the same time, which was not fun. But why don't you believe in clutch? I mean, he's the most clutch player since 2017. Why wouldn't you have him on your team to win games? Because clutch is so important. I'm yeah. I'm obviously you know doing yeah. something here. Yeah. So oh. Uh, because he's no longer on a hot streak. I picked him up when he was like on that 11 or 12 game hit streak. And since then he's had a grand total of three or four hits in 10 days, which yeah, is man. not it's, fun. It's, um, it's pretty interesting how, how people just go out of their way to uh, champion clutch. And then when you see that Adam Frazier has been leading the league in clutch rating, since 2017, it's like suddenly that the clutch argument just goes away. But, but no, I mean, Glabar Torres isn't taking advantage of that matchup, so I mean, that's why I'm losing 16 to 6 to you this week. Uh, JD Davis, uh, yeah, he's still trying to hold on and trying to single-handedly win me the on-base percentage category. Yeah, he had a, he had a four walk game. You don't see that very often, but he had a four walk game against the in the first game of Atlanta, I believe, or the last game of Philly. And that's why that's why I picked him up. I can't believe that in, in a league full of Mets fans, I ended up with J.D. Davis uh, on my team somehow. So I'm pretty proud of that notion. Uh, you mentioned Trevor Story. Uh, Jake Cornworth has uh, been slumping of late. That 167 batting average is not what I signed up for. Uh, but <laughs> it, it was going to happen, right? Yeah, got sooner or later. Such a hot start that this is the, the reality wall that's been hitting this kid. Or this kid. He's 26 years old, right? So, but yeah, Trevor Story living up to um, – his fantasy stock. So the battle of rookies right here, Alec Baum versus Brian Hayes, uh, 367 on base percentage for Hayes, uh, 385 for Alec Baum. So they kind of cancel each other out. Uh, Hayes hitting for more power based on the ISO, 346 versus 174. Still not good enough to overcome the immovable force known as Alec Baum apparently this freaking week. So we move on to Nick Magical versus Tommy Edmond for a middle infield position. Uh, uh, as basically it's the punch and Judy hitters of our lineups here. Uh, this is driving me crazy. I, I picked up Tommy Edmond to help me in stolen bases. And every single time I, I put him out there, this is stolen base net, by the way. All I get from his negativity, negative stolen <laughs> base net. I regret drafting this guy. Or am I overreacting? What do you think, Sean? I think you're overreacting. No, bit. screw that. I'm losing- <laughs> <laughs> it should not happen. I, sh- I-, I should be losing like. 12-10 or, or 11-11. We should be tied at the most. Not getting dominated by you 16-6, but <laughs> regardless. I'm not mad. I'm just, I'm just saying things. Juan Soto also slumping at the most inopportune time for me. Um, I'm, I'm not making excuses. I'm looking for solutions here, folks. I'm just trying to figure out what went wrong. Uh, George Springer, Ian Hack kind of balance each other out. Although Hap has just been, even in my points league, I've just been benching him. I, I, don't, I don't feel comfortable starting him. Uh, every week as I was at the beginning of the season. So uh, DJ Stewart, I picked him up late uh, last week thinking, all right, I, I, I picked up someone who, know, who everybody was sleeping on, and then he proceeds to hit 130 for this week. So, so I, I played myself there. But again, Framiel Reyes is, in, is doing much worse in terms yeah, of he was uh, – Framiel Reyes was the reason – when I was going to pick J.D. Davis, I was going to pick him. I, you know, Intermets fan of me couldn't resist. And then you picked him, and then I had to go pick uh, Framiel Reyes – since uh, you were repping Fran Mill's name in your for your team name this year, <laughs> yeah, and no, Austin's calling me off that I'm overreacting to uh, Tommy Edmund, but I mean, yeah, stolen bases, yeah, that's fine. Unfortunately, we account for getting caught stealing. So, as a as a base dealer, he sucks <laughs> because he, he's getting caught, and it's it's like um, you know what it is, Sean. It's like hiring the best thief in the world, and then you realize that he gets caught like. Three, uh, three out of four times. Or, I'm sorry, he gets caught uh, one out of four times. I mean, it's still a good ratio, but still, the, it, it adds like, up. I, I mean, if you go back know. and look at the regular season, I was, like, by far the best stolen base team. And then in the playoffs, I faced Jet, and Jet has, like, a nine stolen base week against me. Yeah. He had, like, two players that had three net stolen bases for the week. And then in the third-place game against you, I have negative stolen bases. So, it's just one of those things, you know. 
I, I dominate it in the regular season, and then the playoffs come around, and they say, oh, I'm not supposed to get tagged? Like, ugh. oh, my God, it's frustrating. Yeah, that, that's um, – this is why I don't, I don't go out of my way to draft for stolen bases because it's, it's such a – Usually the players who lead in stolen bases, they're, they're, they're scrubs. I'm going to call it for what it is. They're, they're freaking scrubs. They're, they don't do anything else but steal bases. and They're like the kickers of fantasy baseball is how I take but it. But you see, that's why you pick Trevor Story and Jose Ramirez. Trey Turner. Because you know, they run, run, but they yeah. also hit for power. <laughs> no, those are the guys I want. I, I mentioned earlier, I picked the best overall player. One year I picked Trey Turner, and, and he, was, he did wonders for me. I, I, hell, I picked up both Trey Turner and Paul Goldschmidt one season, and I didn't have to pick up any other scrub to steal bases from because my two best players are doing it for me. So that's, that's now, what I'm looking for. I, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, put out some more magical propaganda. Uh, he now has 26 hits on the year, only three extra base hits. All three are doubles. Yeah. Um, he's batting 333, which is, you know, nice. Um, of those 26 hits, 15 of them have come with two strikes. This man cannot be contained with two strikes. It's, it comes out to a sub-700 OPS, but I don't give a damn. He's batting <laughs> 325. I am going back in time. Batting average is the best stat in the world. Nick Madrigal is the best baseball player on the planet. Has to be. Has yeah. to be. He's going to throw back to when baseball fields were 500 feet up there, so you need it. Nick yeah, Madrigal, like, more like Honus Wagner. <laughs> <laughs> Nick Madrigal. That's gonna be that's gonna be the hot take for this episode. <laughs> the Nick Madrigal or Honus Wagner. Either way, legend of the making, right? And I know White Sox fans are rooting for him, and I can hear Bushnell saying, "Hell yeah, you got damn right he is." So yeah. <laughs> uh, bet on the Mets players here. Brandon Nemo versus Dominic Smith. Uh, as you uh, mentioned earlier, Dominic Smith uh, was my best hitter this season in 2020, and again. I picked him off of waivers. So that's how my hitting has gone this year as guys like – Oh, Yonah yes. Gotta, you picked up Smith early off of waivers, like right after the news of Cespedes disappearing broke. L- live while we were on air. I'll always remember that. When Cespedes disappeared – w- No, we were on – We were podcasting live, and Henry said, oh, Cespedes has disappeared. I and I thought he was just talking week. crap because – he was batting like 160 and his bat had disappeared. And he said, no, nah, man, he actually disappeared. <laughs> I was like, I, oh, I hope I he's not, not dead. I did not pick him up, though. <laughs> not, I don't do transactions during the podcast. You guys have one hour window to pick. While well, we tell you who to pick up, you guys have one hour window live on Facebook Sunday mornings to go and pick up those guys. And if you don't pick up those guys after we tell you to pick them up, that's on you. That's why you should be listening to this fucking podcast. So, I mean, you know, I, you know, I'm just saying, I did not pick him up. I would never do a transaction in the middle of a, of a podcast. That, that's not professional, Sean. Not yeah. professional at all. And Brandon Nemo has been, like, on fire for the last, really, two periods. Um, this is a guy who's always walked a lot. He's, you know, for, near a 400 on base percentage over the yeah. last three years, in the top 10 in the league. But this year, and it's something that Mets fans always hate on him. Oh, he always strikes out. He always strikes out, which he has a career um, 26% strikeout rate, which is pretty high. Yeah. But when you work counts like he does, it's bound to happen. But it's this cool. year, he's actually posted a sub 20% strikeout rate. Yeah. In our league, you know, we value both getting on base plus the walk out walks to strikeout ratio and Brandon Nemo, the one week I, I took him out when I was facing jet because I needed more hits and um, it ended up tanking my walk to strikeout ratio. It was absolutely terrible. And I said, I'm not going to make that mistake again. I put him back in the lineup and I have been well rewarded. Listen, man. Nobody <laughs> is a bigger Mets fan than I am. I know Jacob wants to take credit for me picking up Dominic Smith, which I guess I, I, I I remember and, him talking to me. Hey, that means Dom's going to be uh, playing more now. And yeah. And I picked him up in all three of my leagues after that. But, um, but yeah, man, I, I tried getting Brandon Nimmo as well in all my leagues and to, to get the trifecta going of getting J.D. Davis, Dominic Smith, and Brandon Nimmo, and it just didn't work. I, it, you play with so many Mets players, they're eventually going to uh, out-Mets uh, – I'm sorry, Mets owners, and they're going to out-Mets you. But uh, <laughs> I'm actually happy that I got both J.D. Davis and Dominic Smith off of waivers, and they've been uh, – a big integral part of uh, my bounce back, uh, trying to tread through all these injuries and all this inconsistent play. Again, 
a guy you're you're not seeing on the list right here is Yuan Moncada, who has not done anything for me uh, uh, after a certain amount of time. Like he hasn't done anything for me like in over a month. So I've just been benching him because you know I I, I'm, I came I came to play. So I didn't come to play favorites here. Speaking of favorites, though, Luis Robert. Um, no, this was a mistake for me. <laughs> <laughs> It's a mistake. I mean, he looks more like Tim Anderson than he does like Luis Robert. But hey, stolen bases is what I was talking about. At least he can steal bases for me. Yeah. Been five, uh, this whole week, he's gotten two stolen bases this week for me. So that's a victory in itself. But uh, no, everything else is suffering. But it Brutal. is. Meanwhile, your MVP here, Kyle Tucker, the guy who's what was what was his ranking? Twelfth overall. Twelfth. He was twelfth, and oh. it is really making me pause. And make me contemplating that he might be my third keeper. Okay. And I feel like it's a stretch, but I don't feel like any of my pitchers are good enough to keep. And it's either him or George Springer. And he's way younger. Oh, you don't want to keep George Springer, man. Yeah. So I might pick him or I might pick Alec Bohm. I don't know. Alec Bohm has been really, really good. Yeah. Hey, listen, you got all all season to figure that out, man. But you don't want to – don't – don't. friends do not let friends – Keep George Springer unless they unless their lineup is real crap and your lineup's not crap at all. Uh, or Otani, like I, and that's the thing is Otani's been so bad, but at the same time, if he gets a chance to pitch next year, it's like I want him. No, you, friends do not let friends uh, keep Shohei Otani for next season either. It's not, it's not <laughs> Am I allowed to keep anybody from you then? Actually, don't keep anybody. Just give me all your good players like Trevor Story and Jorge no, Ramon. they're 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 staying for sure. <laughs> I'll Tucker, I'll take Kyle Tucker if you're not keeping him. I mean, sure, why not? Uh, but no, man, uh, this is it. I mean, it's no wonder that your team is beating the crap out of my team. You, you do have all of these uh, top 20 players on, on your hitting list. Meanwhile, Dominic Smith is just carrying me at number 30. I'm looking at my pitching list on a different screen. I and mean, my pitching list is a little bit more consistent. Because I do have two players in the top 20, two more players in the top 40, and a bunch of players in the top 60. So that might explain why I was able to get so far despite of all the inconsistent hitters. But let's take a look at the pitching right now. I mean, Dylan Bundy has been an integral part of my season. This week, he decides to shift the bed. 16.88 um, ERA, as Austin, who's listening in still, I believe, can uh, attest to that. Uh, I'm pretty sure he's just as frustrated as an Angels fan to see this line as I am as a fantasy baseball owner. Uh, for a second there, I almost forgot that I had Tyler Glass now. There he you is. Know, it, it's like – is he my pitcher that I keep? But it's like, I don't trust him to go deep into games. But he has 83 strikeouts in 50 innings. How do you not pick that? Oh, my God. <laughs> 83 makes its appearance once again in the Total Bases podcast. Uh, you know, uh, if I may do a little quick anecdote, right? Anecdote, not anecdote, anecdote. Uh, Walter Payton's family, you know Walter Payton football, right? Like yes. Winning back, of course, yeah. They always say that anytime that uh, some event happens to them, that they believe that Walter's still talking to them because it, it, there's always the number 34, which was his jersey number. So the number 34 is just, it's everywhere. Uh, and, and they take it as a sign that he's watching over them, which is a really sweet story. Me, my number is 83. All right. <laughs> so any, anything, of, any of, anything of importance that happens to me, the number 83 is always following me around, right? So. So I don't know who's watching over me, but the fact that you mentioned that Glass has 83 strikeouts, it, it, it's a serendipity right there. Um, who the hell's Tanner Hope? That is rookie, a uh, right-handed pitcher, or right or left. It, if you click on his name, it should show. Um, tall guy, doesn't really throw hard, but in his first major league start, he was actually hitting like 95. Mm-hmm. Um, he's always been one of those kind of – interesting guys because you would think for with how big he is he would throw harder and he's not really a a big ground ball guy I don't know he's an interesting player um kind of one of those post-hype prospects starting pitchers um and of course with some of the pitchers that Boston has thrown out there Tanner Hook might as well be you know Clayton Kershaw so And, and I decided to run with him. He had his first major league start against Miami, went five innings, seven strikeouts, um, got the win. Uh, congratulations to him. But uh, I, I felt like I needed to stream somebody just in case, yeah. and he was available, so I went and picked him up. That's a good pickup for you, man. Yeah, worked me, out great. I'm going to depend on Dylan Seeds, who has not been dependable at all for me this year, but I, I got to keep him around because he's so young and he has so much upside. 
But yeah, I'm not expecting much. But I figure this is the last game of the season. Why not? It's against, it's against a broken Reds team. What can go wrong, right? So uh, yeah. you got Frankie Montez, uh, former White Sox, going to. Uh, yeah, he was supposed to be starting today, and he's not starting today. So he's it ends up not making any starts for me this week. Well, that sucks for you. And you're. I think he went on the paternity list. So congratulations to uh, Frankie Montez and his family. Yeah, how about that? I, I, aside from paternity, I, I'm sorry. Aside from COVID and all the injuries and all the. Um, the, the weirdness of the season, you still had players uh, uh, having to leave because of baby, baby reasons, newborn reasons. So, and as a father myself, as a new, brand new father myself, I sympathize completely. As a fantasy baseball owner, it frustrates me to no end. So, Lucas Giolito, current White Sox, um, he's been pretty damn good for me this year. Really good after a, a, a slow start to this season. But yeah, this was not the, not the start that I was depending on. Uh, as we wind our season down. So that's been disappointing. You got a couple of Mariners pitchers here. They both suck ass this week. Yeah, L- LJ got blown up. And it was like, I. it was really unfortunate for him because he was slated to start last Saturday. And then they had the COVID outbreak on San Francisco. So the d- games got delayed. And then he was supposed to start on Tuesday and then they canceled the game due to all the smoke. And then mm-hmm. they went back to San Francisco. And at this point, I was like, wow, he just went from pitching against, I think, like Houston or something. And now he's going to be pitching in San Francisco in that pitcher-friendly ballpark. Hell yeah, that's awesome. And he proceeded to give up five runs in three <laughs> innings. Uh, just lots of hits. And that's kind of his thing is he's going to just throw lots and lots of strikes. And he's going to have those games where – the guys just swing the bat. They're not, they're going to be seeing it well. Um, so that one didn't work out for me. I still believe in LJ Newsom though. I, I like young pitchers who throw strikes. They can learn to miss bats later. <coughs> Shane Bieber. Um, I'm not saying LJ Newsom is going to be Shane Bieber, but you know, if he is, I said it first. <laughs> and the other Mariners picture was you say Kikuchi, which I don't want to talk about. I say Kikuchi, not you I say. I say Kikuchi, you say Kikuchi. <laughs> potato, potato. You that say Kikuchi, Kikuchi, I say don't start him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Zach Plesak uh, makes his triumphant return. When did he return? I don't. I, uh, I, last week. He he started last week, um, but then he had an immaculate inning uh, just what? yesterday or two days ago. So congrats to him. Doesn't happen very often. In my points league, I tried trading Hunter Dozier for Zach Plesak while he was uh, being punished for that whole COVID thing. Um, sadly, the other owner did not budge. So someone else believes in Zach Plesak the way I believe in Zach Plesak. Uh, well, if I believe in Zach Plesak, he'd be on my points league team already, but he's not. So, oh, well. Pablo Lopez, though, he uh, got hammered last week. Decent comeback this week. Uh, I know he got me 27 points in my points league. Uh, I'm looking at the stat line. It's not that impressive, but it's a lot more impressive than it was. It was solid. It was, it, was, it was a good start. And I think he starts one more time this week. Let me just double check that. Before we yeah, on. he's slated to start the 24th at Atlanta. Not that oh. we will be using it in our league, but. Never mind. I thought he was slated for two starts. But anyway. So, no, no I'm, I'm, I'm happy with Pablo Lopez uh, this week. Uh, and I picked up Joe Musgrove uh, and substituted him in the hopes that he does something against the Cardinals. Uh, it's, it's a Hail Mary throw as far as I'm concerned. And Zach Wheeler, you've been talking about him all season long, about how he's been amazing in Philly. Yeah, so, and, and the weird thing with him is, is he hasn't struck anybody out, but the whip and ERA are both crazy low. I mean, yeah, I mean, he went seven and a third and only struck out two, and this is one of the hardest throwing starting pitchers in all of baseball. And he's got a great slider, great curveball. You would think, like, where are these strikeouts? And um, a lot of people have been wondering that. But I kind of dug in deeper to it. The swinging strike is about the same. The whiffs are also about the same. The, his whiff percentage in total um, has dropped uh, down from the last two years that, you know, he had the really good years with the Mets. Um, and what we're seeing a lot of is he's throwing the sinker more, and he's always been very good at limiting hard contact and I think he's throwing that sinker earlier in counts, and he's got a okay, pretty solid defense, infield defense, and so he's been very much economical, and that's allowed him to throw a lot of innings so far this year. I want to say he's top 10 in innings this year. 
and I didn't realize we were already at the 50 minute mark uh, according to the feed here. So uh, I, 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 we started talking about our teams and this time flies when you're having fun here. So uh, just quickly lightning, lightning round aspect. Adam Wainwright has been good this year. Jesus Lozaro has been a disappointment for me. Daniel Bart I picked up so he can get me some cheap saves this week. Nothing from him this week. Tyler Duffy, I don't want to talk about these other guys. Trevor Rosenthal has been a bounce back candidate. He's, he's saved all my uh, other fantasy leagues from uh, total implosion in terms of getting <laughs> saves. Amir Garrett, uh, I dropped him because he was giving up too many home runs in the last couple of weeks. And then he picks up his first career save. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, Taylor Ferguson enough for this season now with Tommy John surgery. He's uh, been a ratio saver for me this year, but yeah, until he wasn't. Uh, Dane Dunning's going today. Kevin Gossman has the elbow. Well, suppose he had an elbow issue and comes back and throws a decent game against, uh, I forgot who he played, but uh, maybe it was, maybe the, it was uh, Seattle, I believe. Oh, of course. Yeah, that, that'll fix your elbow. <laughs> uh, and then just like, again, too quickly round out Edwin Diaz. Still, and I'm calling him Diaz until he gets his act together. Hey, um, he has he been – he's been one of the best relief pitchers in baseball this year. Right, right, right. Uh, speaking of which, James Karinczak uh, also has been one yeah, of the Yeah, like best I said, I got a lot of good relief pitchers. Yeah, like not this week, though. I mean, he's been brutal. Yeah, he's been – he had – it's, he like, weird. He's had these these, bow, these bad outing, outings have come in, like, bunches. Like, he'll have two bad outings and then two good ones and then two bad ones. and But he's still awesome. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I, he faced the Cubs, and that's going to happen when you face the Cubs. I, I, <laughs> the, only, the only explanation I have for you, Rafael Montero. Ooh, geez, I thought you had good relief pitchers, man. What's going on? Yeah, except him. <laughs> uh, Drew Pomerantz, uh, you know, he's not the Dave's guy anymore, but he still holds his own. He's still a very valuable relief pitcher, especially in this format. Trevor Rogers, who I think you've talked about before. Um, Rich Dick Mountain on your team, huh? Yeah, yeah, Dick Mountain finally had a breakthrough start. I have him in that d- giant dynasty league, and it was, like, wonderful that he finally had a good start. And, of course, you have Freddie Peralta getting you two wins because you're just a homer about the game. <laughs> but, Gotta uh, love those relief pitcher wins. So that's how our week is going. Like, again, championship game. Uh, the other two matches, I think, uh, is it this game I right hear? Jim Brady versus uh, Andrew O'Sullivan. They're, they're playing for fifth for the fifth pick overall. Yes, season. I believe so. And then, well, look at this. Mar- our very own Mario Mergola and uh, uh, James, right? James Handeboat? Yes. Uh, they're fighting for seventh place, uh, seventh uh, pick overall next season, and they're going to go down to the wire. So I can't wait to unveil the uh, or reveal the, uh, the top 12 for next season in terms of the draft. It should be interesting. Um, the only thing we do know is that Whelan has number one pick overall. And let's let's talk about it. Let's talk about it as uh, there's a picture of my wife and I here. But uh, <laughs> let's talk about uh, maybe some strategies. Let's have some fun. Uh, if you're Matt Whelan, uh, what do you do with the number one pick overall next season? Do you look to trade it? I mean, because we are allowed to trade picks in our league. Uh, unfortunately, because of the shortened season, I don't think people had a chance to uh, really utilize that aspect of the, of the, uh, of the strategy there. But no, what if- do you do? I'm him. I think he has a good enough core right now that you hold on to it. And off the top of my head, looking at his roster, the keepers for him are probably going to be Freddie Freeman, Jacob DeGrom, and he's got one other slot. And that could be filled by any one of – he has Jordan Alvarez if he wants to keep him, Dylan Carlson if he wants to keep the rookie who's struggled a little bit, or Mike Yastrzemski who's, you know, had a career year. Um so that third keeper slot's going to be the question mark for him. But anyone who – he's going to get a good player, number one overall, obviously. Um, I would hold on to it and just add to that because he is possibly the best hitter, one of the best hitters, and one of the best pitchers in the league. So he's got a, a good foundation to start with. He's just got to add to it. Oh, someone's not been paying attention. What's going on? I thought we were supposed to have, like, all these safeguards to make sure that this doesn't happen, Sean. Oh, no. Oh, no. Fan track, they're failing us. Uh, basically, uh, Whelan has had an illegal lineup and still got the number one pick overall for next year. So. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. I mean, I mean it's – Lux just – when did Lux get called up? Beginning of – end of August. So, damn, he's been up for a long time. Uh, I mean, unless uh, Casey Mize got – called up recently and I'm not aware of it. But, uh, no, Mize, Mize has been up since the end of August. 
So this is Whelan's team, Freddie Freeman, Max, uh, no, no, that's not him. I'm not keeping him. I might consider Eloy Jimenez. I know that I told Bushnell that all the time that Eloy is starting to look like an outfielder. Like there, there are a dime a dozen, these power hitting outfielders uh, that you don't, don't be overvaluing him because he's a White Sox player. But now I'm looking at his lineup and it's like, maybe Eloy should be a, a, a keeper candidate for next year. Um, Bo Bichette. I, you know me, I'm a big fan of Bo Bichette. There's another. Oh yeah. Yeah. Bichette should be, I, I forgot that he had him. I, I looked right over him. Uh, Jordan Alvarez, you know why I don't keep him, right? Because he's left-handed. And he's injured. And, he, <laughs> and, he's, and he's, he's, injured. The age. he's already had double knee, double knee surgeries. Him it's and, you know, an assessment is pulling up into the surgery center, like the Spider-Man meme, pointing at each other. Who's the worst outfielder, Jordan Alvarez or Eloy Jimenez? From what I had seen, like, he only played, like, 10 games last year. He didn't look terrible in the outfield. He just looked slow. Yeah. But it's like he looked like he knew what he was doing. That's Eloy Jimenez looks like he's scared to run after the ball. <laughs> like he, it's like he's praying the ball's not hit to him every time. Yeah, there's Jacob DeGrom that you mentioned. Uh, well, that's why Luis Robert plays both left field and right uh, and center field just for Eloy's. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it looks like Jacob DeGrom might be his best. I mean, he still has Ian Anderson. Might That might be a consideration. Uh, Casey Mice, he needs to fix that because he's driving me crazy. Like right now, tomorrow, today. Actually, it doesn't matter because the season's over. But so that's uh, yeah. Let go. Look at that. We're giving free advice to Matthew Whelan, who we should. He's in our league. We shouldn't have to give him advice. We should let him sink or drown on his own, or sink or swim on his own. And yet, we are here to make to do service with you people. So we are providing a service that is not necessary, but we're going to give it to you anyway because we care. This is the life group difference, you guys. So that's his team right there. Um, this is the last week of the season as far as we're concerned. I know other people are playing for next week. Uh, and I wanted to, to talk about just for a little bit about um, maybe what do you do at this point of the season as a, if you're in a keeper league or a dynasty league. Uh, I know we might have touched about this uh, maybe a few weeks ago, but this is a different time frame now um, as we're getting really close to the end. Sean Flannery, what do you do at this part of the season if you're in a keeper league? In how we have it right now where we're only allowing – allowing three keepers um i feel like you look at your roster and you figure out you know who your three best players were from this past season and of those three do you believe in the breakout or do you believe in the numbers they gave you Uh, this is such a weird season Uh, we've had a lot of players or a lot of you know fantasy players who have players on their roster who they spent top five picks on and they did terrible you know, Christian Yelich, Cody Bellinger, both have been awful in terms of fantasy. I mean, there's really no getting around it. Don't – just like I said, if you – do you buy their numbers at the same time? Do you buy that they actually are this bad? Yeah. Um, I wouldn't not keep a Yelich or a Bellinger. I mean, there's – I feel like some people will do it, but I'm not going to be one of those people. Yeah, you kind of have to. Uh, I mean, I, I have Christian Yelich in my points league, and I'm most definitely, unless some freaky thing happens, I am 99% sure that I'm going like, to keep Christian Yelich for next season because this is this is this season is such an anomaly that I, I I cannot just forget how he carried my team single handedly in 2019. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I I have to give it one more chance. I mean, he's still in his early what? How old is he now? 30 30 years old, maybe. 29-30, something like that. Yeah, so he's still on the right side of 30. Um, it's, it's not like he's over the hill. I, mean, he, I know that he had that, that knee surgery or that knee, that freakish knee injury from that. Uh, 28, 28. Yeah, oh, so, yeah, so he, he's fine. I mean, And he is still, in his terrible, terrible year, he's in the 99th percentile in exit velocity, 97th percentile of hard hit, hit rate, 82nd percentile expected WOBA. Um, just what we're seeing this year is him striking out and whiffing. Uh, we started to see the whiffs go up as he started launching the ball more, but he's never been a strikeout guy like this, and he struck out 30% of the time. And that's just something that never happened before. That doesn't sound right, but, I mean, you talked about value. I mean, this was – you can't argue with the top five. Look, and all outfielders, too, look at that. 
in our draft this year, in the fantasy. Yep. One, two, three, four, five. I mean, Cody Bellinger qualifies at first, but I think he qualifies in the outfield as well. Our top five were outfielders, and this just goes to show how dependable hitters, especially outfielders, are, uh, at least coming into this season, before we saw our first pitcher and our first infielder. So, I mean, even I picked up an outfielder. I was very – I mean, we talked about this at the beginning of the season. I was very surprised to see Juan Soto there, and then you yeah. end up getting – If you had not picked Juan Soto, I would have. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, and I, I and you know what? And the crazy part, uh, Sean, in all my mock drafts, I was not picking Juan Soto whatsoever. You know and why you weren't picking him? No, I just because well, he's I a left-handed hitter. I was that. Oh, yes, he's <laughs> but <laughs> but aside from that, I mean, he was, he was going a lot earlier than that as well, yeah. and because I was practicing for late rounds because that's, that's a little bit more challenging than practicing for the early rounds. Because you know, I mean, yeah, I can blindly pick Ronald Acuna as my number one pick overall, right? But it's what you do at these positions at 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. That's where it becomes really challenging. Um, but no, I, I lucked on Juan Soto. I like him. I'm going to keep him for a while uh, for the duration of the three-year period that we have to, as a keeper. Uh, but yeah, it's like these are the guys that you drafted the top 12 with the idea that they're also going to come on board next week. And I think for the most part, a lot of these guys will be coming back next year, I should say. Not next week. Next year on these teams. Yeah. Would you agree with that assessment? Yeah, I, I, I believe so. Yeah, and then you get to the second round, then it gets really murky. I mean, Glavar Torres, for me, after this season, I don't know. I don't know. He's going to be a shortstop next year, and he's going to be a shortstop if he doesn't steal bases next year. So I'm kind of in a crossroads as to what, what to do with him. But you know what? Isn't it interesting that the top two hitters in our league uh, by our format were both picked in the second round? Uh, uh, Fernando Tatis and who else? Trey Turner. Yeah, Trey Turner is ridiculously underrated. Ridiculously underrated. And, and he had back, maybe the quietest, first. like, 900 OPS. He hasn't, like, gone crazy with the steals. I think he only has, like, five or six net stolen bases. He might have a couple actual total. But um, he's been a great offensive threat this year, you know, kind of taking the place of uh, Anthony Rendon. Look at him. Nine home runs, nine stolen bases. He's yeah. uh, one each. I think he's been caught four times, four or five, or four times. Yeah, well, you know, but for roto leaguers, I mean, yeah, that's great. That, that's the production. Yeah, it's no Trevor Story, eleven home runs and twelve net stolen bases, but you know, <laughs> tomato, tomato. Yeah, uh, and then after like what pick number seven in the second round, then it gets real murky because all the pitches are being selected, and that's what we're learning, right? Maybe don't go early on pitchers. I mean, Walker Bueller, Justin Verlander, Max Scherzer. Jack Flaherty, um, yeah. Uh, it, um, I'm going to be very interested to see what Mergola does with Jack Flaherty because that is someone who, you know, obviously pitching was a big issue for me this year. Yeah. Um, if I keep – if all three of my keepers are the three guys I, I just mentioned, my the guys that were all top 12 hitters, I might just do the opposite of what I did last year in my first four picks pick pitchers. <laughs> <laughs> That's strange, though. I mean, so so far we're looking at all the pitchers who were selected, and, and Garrett Cole had, was predictably going to be the best one, and so far he has been. Well, actually, it was uh, him and DeGrom going back and forth. Uh, oh, there's DeGrom right there. Yep. But after those two, then it gets real murky in terms of the pitchers. I yeah, mean, the, the top reason... two actual pitchers for our league were Shane Bieber, who went at the beginning of round three, and Lance Lynn, who I want to say um, Jet got him around seven or eight. Wow. And then – but before Shane Bieber got selected by uh, Jim Grady's team up in Rhode Island, Aaron Judge and Pete Alonso, back-to-back New York sluggers going uh, before him. And so far, Shane Bieber has been outclassing everybody. Maybe everybody in this in this uh, round right here. Uh, would you, yep. I mean, would you agree that Shane Bieber yeah. might have been the best player? By, by far. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, here's me picking up Noah Syndergaard for no reason. <laughs> Look yeah. at me. I, I wanted all of those pitchers, and I ended up getting stuck with George Springer in between two guys who ended up having Tommy John surgery. So <laughs> fate fate intervened for me. There you go, man. There you go. Oh, yeah, next year we're going to be uh, drafting next to each other again. And this time you will have the advantage uh, picking in the, uh, picking before me in the, in the, odd, in the odd rounds. So uh, you Let's might go. <laughs> you might get <laughs> – you might get some muffins. I might get my cuppins, and you might get your revenge that like you've been so Next wanting. time, uh, 
you send me your rankings, I'm going to get a, a quick 007, you know, pull out the lighter phone and take a picture of it and save it and go into the draft board and just start picking everyone off of your rankings. That's the crazy part, isn't it? It's like, this is what I talk about. We tell you who to pick. We <laughs> tell you who to pick up. We tell you what to do. And then, that, I mean, that's the balls. I mean, Matt Bushnell brought it up when he was here. Like, I, I, I would be – I don't want to share my football, my fantasy football acumen, because I'm afraid that other people like Felipe are going to just pick up on the intel. This is the opposite. We're very transparent. We tell you what to do, and we dare you to do it. Go ahead. <laughs> Take our strategy. I show fun. Here's my rankings. What are you going to do about it? Nothing, because I'm still going to steal your players. <laughs> I'm going to steal your players anyway. And if you steal my players, that's fine. I didn't want him anyway. I, got, I, got, <laughs> I didn't want him anyway. <laughs> I got a backup plan. I got backup plans. I mean, I mean, shoot. Oh, what, 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 the fourth round. Oh, I'm going to get Felipe. I'm going to get Cattell Marte. All right, I'll just pick up Luis Robert. He's a player that I've been coveting anyway. <laughs> Although oh, my God. I bad, forgot but... about Cattell Marte. Yeah. yeah. Do I keep him? I, I don't know. Well, let's find out. Let's, I know he's had a decent – His season. power uh, has evaporated. He still hit for a high average, but, like, that 500 slugging he had last year is just gone. Yeah, I think you should uh, – no, I don't think I'm going to take any stock in this guy. No, sir. No, sir, Bob. Do two more rounds right here, uh, Sean, if you don't mind, and then we can call it a night or a day and get ready for football. Uh, but, but, but Chris Paddock, I don't, really, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing here. Uh, Josh Hader, wow. I think I might have been the first relief pitcher going. Yeah, uh, there's Lance Lynn in round six. I, I was close. I, I thought it was seven, but. There he is. Uh, yep. Yeah, so look at this. You want to you see this? this the number this two overall pitcher. How many pitchers went in front of Lance Lynn? A lot. A lot. But look, uh, in the fifth pick in the fifth round, Aaron picked up Josh Hader. In the fifth pick in the sixth round, Jet picked up Lance Lynn. What do they have in common? They're both playing in the championship game this week. Yep. So maybe this is the key right here. Whoever wins the – whoever selects the best player or the best pitcher in the fifth pick with the, in, in, the, <laughs> in the middle of these rounds, they're going to go to the championship. I hope Gravy and Sullivan are listening then. Because <laughs> they're gonna have one of them is gonna have the fifth overall pick or the fifth overall. We're gonna have to give it a nickname, like give it the, the golden draft or the golden <laughs> round, the golden shower round. Oh whoa! <laughs> <laughs> That's what the winner gets. That's one of the prizes. The golden for the shower. Bag. Don't spoil it. <laughs> hey, I heard you guys wanted my services. Can I see some ID first? I'm gonna walk away because we're too old. But anyway. That's another story for a different time. That's more of a puck poker thing than a baseball life thing. Um, <laughs> uh, so with that said, I mean, there's Manny Machado. That's been a that's been a steal for. He was one of the top hitters. I, he was top ten, I believe. You think Jacob's format. gonna keep him next year? Hmm. You think Jacob's gonna keep him next year? He is the well Ponzi, right? Uh, he is. He might still be in the comments. Uh, I'm not sure if he's actually paying attention, but he very well could. I, I Jacob's draft was actually one of my favorites, yeah. even though he did pick Manny Machado. And I, I don't mess with Manny Machado. I got burned by that one too many times. But uh, he had a Harper, Acuna, and Machado, and it just didn't work out for him. Yeah, he's trying to pick up all the Puerto Rican players uh, from the WBC from a couple years ago. Carlos Correa, Javier Baez, uh, Manny Machado, although he's Dominican, I believe, like Caribbean player, whatever. Yeah, man, that, that's pretty impressive if you can get Carlos Correa, Javier Baez, and Manny Machado all in the same draft. Yeah, his um, he had Acuna, Harper. I, I really like those picks, and then Machado and Baez, I thought really wow, worked out he well. Picked up Bryce Harper too. Yeah, uh, his thing was pitching. He had a terrible, terrible, terrible pitching. Max Bide. Patrick Max. Corbin was his SP number one, and Patrick Corbin in only the second year of that big five year, like one hundred and twenty five million dollar deal looks absolutely spent. I'm not sure if it was what they did with him in the postseason. But his – I mean, he throws two pitches, the fastball and a slider, and his fastball is barely hit, cracking 90 now. So, well, you're right. Uh, there's trouble brewing in Washington. Two giant uh, contracts with Corbin yeah. – well, I mean, three, including Scherzer. But Corbin and Strasburg look like um, bad things are not – or bad things are on the horizon. He says know? it's – He's chiming in now. He says he's considering Manny Machado, uh, the Jacob is. Who, by the way, uh, Step Back Podcast on Wednesday nights. So go listen to that uh, with Leon and Jacob Moses. Uh, did you know that Jacob Moses is related to Edwin Moses, the uh, sprint runner? The yes. Oh, okay. Yes, he, he has uh, mentioned that. Oh, yeah. that's, that's a pretty cool factoid right there. 
But now I look at this team, I mean, it, it looks like a really good 2017, 2018, 2019 ball club right there. Yeah, he says Acuna, Harper, and I'm not sure who else. Okay. Uh, right. I mean, if you go based solely on this shortened 2020 season, then Manny Machado is probably the play. If you're thinking in terms of keeper, you might, especially since he invested so much in to, to get Pete Alonso, getting him 25th overall, yeah. um, you might have to keep Pete Alonso and just hope he bounces back. It was a really nice team, though. I'm very – like I said, it just didn't translate to 2020. And like I said, the pitchers were – Yeah, were he's like me. Awful. He's got to rebuild the pitching staff. Yeah, I mean, but Tantas was not a good idea at that spot. Uh, Dakota Hudson, I, I heard something interesting about Dakota Hudson, and I completely forgot what it was, but it does have something to do with uh, his pitching uh, arsenal or his pitching stuff or how crappy he is. And, uh, that might have been a saving grace for him. I don't know if he actually kept him throughout the year. Aaron Savali, who became a waiver wire darling, but not for Jacob. He picked him up right away, uh, getting ahead of the curve there for many people. Uh, yeah. Well, we have a lot of drafted players. We drafted yes. a lot of players this year, but that's because, well, no, that was, that was, yeah, I'm thinking of shortening the roster for next year just because it's, it's too much. I don't know. We'll talk about it as commissioners, uh, you and I, Sean. But um, that's pretty much it. That's all we had. Any last parting words uh, for you, uh, Sean? Not much other than it's been real, you know, just like how quickly it came, you know, the fantasy baseball playoffs are, are ending. And I'm very proud of this, man. Uh, this is like we started this league. What I, again? We can't remember exactly when. Twenty sixteen, twenty seventeen. Yeah. Uh, and it's been just years in the making to get it to this point where we're in a uh, using fan tracks who offer so much customization um, beyond our wildest dreams, and just you and I talking all winter long about how are we gonna set this up, what are we doing, and just tinkering. I don't know if people saw in our league the number of changes that you and I made. <laughs> just to get it to this format that we wanted in our minds. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a good thing and it's a bad thing. It's, um, it's a curse and it's, uh, and it's a gift that we are able to customize it so much. But it's a lot of babysitting. As you saw, I mean, we got to take care of Whelan's team and make sure that he follows the rules. Yeah, I'm calling him out. But, you know, you know, you know what, what I'm afraid of, Sean, is that a certain someone's going to protest and say, well, why does he get the number one pick with an illegal lineup? So, actually, let's just uh, pretend that – thank you, Austin. Let's just pretend that this conversation never happened. Uh, <laughs> really quick, uh, quick shout out to all the other podcasts. Like I said, uh, that's something I want to improve upon. So I got to look for that list. But uh, obviously, Dong City tomorrow uh, with Vincent Henry, I believe. I, I need to, if they give a listen to this, you know, they're always doing the highlights. They need to go find Brandon Nimmo, um, hit a big home run the ninth inning against Philadelphia. And if you've ever seen Brandon Nimmo play a baseball game, when he walks, he sprints to first. When he, when he hits a home run, he sprints around the bases. Wow. Well, and, it, and it's always instantaneous. He hits it and he's sprinting. Well, he hit this big go-ahead home run in the ninth inning. And for, uh, as Brandon or as uh, Jacob calls him, golly Nimmo, because he's just like one of those, oh, shucks type of guys. <laughs> and he hit this home run. And he actually stopped and stared at it for a little bit and was like kind of overwhelmed with it. And then he started sprinting. It was the first time I've ever seen him like stop and admire a home run. And uh, I know we were making a lot of jokes about like Brandon Nemo calling his mom after the game and saying, Hey ma, I, I, I pimped a home run. I don't know what it means. I think D Dom Smith, he taught it to me though. And he said, I pimped it. And it was just one of those – it's the funniest thing in the world because he is one of the – he just – he sprints. Do that. And he actually stopped and stared at it. And then when they interviewed him after the game, <laughs> he said, oh, crap, I better get around the bases. <laughs> I could definitely see a, a, a situation where – because, you know, no one's a bigger Mets fan than I am, even, even among Mets fans. I'm like the biggest Mets fan ever. And um, I could definitely see a dynamic of Brandon Nemo and Dominic Smith where Dominic Smith is teaching him how to be more hip. Oh, it, uh, it's very much, you know, Dom is the West Coast kid, you know, grew up inner city. And then you have Brandon Nimmo from Wyoming. the farms of Wyoming. So, yeah, we've always made the joke that he's the one who uh, cultures Nimmo up a bit. <laughs> he learned about Kwanzaa this past year with Dominic Smith on the bench. <laughs> That's fun. That is hilarious. I don't know if Dom actually 
uh, believes in Kwanzaa or not, but not just the generalization, obviously, but I'm pretty But sure no, uh, in regards to the other podcast, I'll, I'll let you get back. Other than I want to give a shout out to the uh, crossover that happened this past week between Step Back and Pod Jobbers. Yeah. Um, I listened to that one on my way into and back from work and I was dying laughing. Jake Schwartz and their guys, they've had great guests on, including this last week when they had Jacob and Leon over from the step back for their little crossover episode. It was a lot of fun to listen to. Yeah. And I appeared on the, well, uh, well, yeah, the audible is next Tuesday night. So with Matt and Randy, actually they do double duty They're, You know how we talk about the uh, two start pitchers. Well, they do two, Two start podcast, uh, Tuesdays Oof. and Fridays. Tuesday Dedication, night, guys. Friday afternoons. Well, I mean, nobody likes football more than Matt Bushnell and Randy Hammond, and that, that just proves it right there. Uh, so they're on Tuesday. I was on the show on Tuesday last week with Matt talking about uh, the Fantasy League and uh, plugging our show as best I can because that's what I do. Wednesday, the lab, Johnny and Matt, which yesterday I, I did a, a Latino forum with uh, Renee and Angel, and we did talk about food yesterday afternoon. Uh, which really sucked for me because I hadn't eaten all morning. <laughs> so, yeah, we got to the food, and I'm just salivating, and I'm just, like, starving. We talked about the step back Wednesday nights uh, over at Ball is Life. Thursdays, pod jobbers with uh, Jake and Charlie Martinez and Brandon. Brandon, Brandon Nemo, no, Brett Moore um, <laughs> at Wrestling Life. And uh, Sundays, we either end your week or we start your week. It doesn't matter. But we're going to be continuing to do weekend uh, shows for you guys, talking some baseball and this is going to be right around our wheelhouse, uh, Sean. This is our wheelhouse. We, the season's over. Now we got to start over again and show off our predictive powers for 2021. So I'm looking very much forward to talking some more baseball with you and uh, everybody else who listens to this show. Yeah, for sure, man, for sure. All right, that's a good place to stop. All right, guys, thank you so much, and we'll see you guys next weekend.